We look at James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Uh, as we <clears throat> think about, Lord, I need help. Lord, I need help. And as we look at this passage, it's interesting in the context. Uh, those of you who were in the classes learning how to study the English Bible, you recall how I said you must stay in your context and you must know your context in order to properly understand the passage. And this context is so important here because the immediate context, as we studied last week, has to do with trials and suffering. And then in those trials and suffering, as we looked at last week, this week, we're told and encouraged through James by the Holy Spirit, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And so we all need the wisdom of God in our lives. So this is what we're going to be looking at today as we cry out, Lord, I need help. What we need help with is God's wisdom. What is God's wisdom? Shall we pray before we study? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for your love and your grace to us. And we thank you for this worship service and your presence here by your Holy Spirit. As we continue to worship you, Father, may we focus on your word as you would instruct us by your Holy Spirit. And we, our hearts would be open to be instructed and our lives conform to the image of Jesus Christ. So speak to us for our ears and our hearts are attentive to you. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand for the reading of God's holy word, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, first of all, we're told here by the Holy Spirit that if any of you lacks wisdom, now we have to stop right there. We have to admit the need that we have for wisdom. Are you and I in a position in our lives to where we can admit to God, help me, Lord, I don't know. Before we ask, we have to admit to ourselves before God, I need help. I need help. And notice this is, if any of you lacks wisdom, it's interesting to me that James was not led by the Holy Spirit to say, if any of you lack knowledge, but if any of you lack wisdom. Wisdom has two parts to it. It's knowledge and how to apply that knowledge. It's one thing to have knowledge and not be able to apply it. It's another thing to have the knowledge that we need and then be able to apply it. And so this is what James is talking about here. In wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, lacks knowledge, lacks understanding, and the ability to apply it, let him ask God. Let him ask God. Now we need to look at the verb to ask. Because this particular verb to ask means an inferior asking a superior. An inferior asking a superior. So when we pray to God and we worship him and we pray, we praise him, it's always 
Each of us is inferior to superior, our Heavenly Father, the true and living God. Do you ever find yourself telling God what He needs to do? If you ever pray, God, you have got to do this. We're all guilty, aren't we? You have to do it this way. No, He doesn't. And the nerve of any of us to give Him orders to tell Him what He needs to do. No. We're not above Him and we direct Him on how He's going to take care of us. We humble ourselves before Him. We admit that He indeed is the true and living God and beside Him there are no other gods. And then we go before Him and we ask for wisdom. Now, we ask for His wisdom. He is the only source of wisdom that you and I should draw from. And so we go to Him for this knowledge and the application of this knowledge. How do I use this? So if any of you is lacking wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously. Generously. Look at that word generously. It, it's a real interesting word. It, it means without reserve. Without reserve. When you and I pray for wisdom, God's not going to give us just a tad. He's going to give us everything we need in knowledge and how to use that knowledge. He's not going to withhold anything from us. And then that prepositional phrase, to all. <clears throat> that means God will give it to us personally. Not all of us need the same wisdom. We need different knowledge at different times and how to apply that knowledge. And God knows that. And God gives us exactly what we need. Y'all ever buy something and you get home to put it together? And you pull out those infamous instructions. And you either get the wrong instructions for the product you've bought or the way in which they're written, you can't understand it. And so you throw the instructions down, you put it together, and you don't worry about the parts that are left over. You'll use them later on. <laughs> right? God doesn't do that. The instructions, the wisdom and knowledge that God gives to you and to me is exactly what we need for the situation we don't know what to do. He gives that to you and me. But we have to ask. And we have to have the right attitude when we ask. Well, he's the superior. I'm the inferior. And he gives that to all. And look at the next word on there. He gives that to all without reproach. Without reproach. That is, he doesn't insult us. You back again? Can't you get it right? You want me to draw you a picture? What, are you dumb or something? He doesn't do that. He's always there. And whenever we ask for His wisdom and whatever you and I need, it doesn't matter how many times we're asked, He's going to give it to us. And he's going to communicate it in such a manner that you and I will be able to understand it. And not only will he give us the knowledge that we're asking for, but then by his Holy Spirit, he will give us the ability to apply it. So this is what we have here in verse 5. And notice the last phrase in verse 5, it will be given him. That is a definite promise. God doesn't say, give, come to me and I'll give it to you. No, I'm not going to do that. I changed my mind. He will never do that to you or to me. We ask, he gives. And this is a promise we have from him. Now, let's look at verse 6. How do we ask? Look what verse 6 says. 
but let him ask in faith with no doubting. Let him ask in faith. The asking in faith <clears throat> means that we're prompted to ask God for this wisdom by our faith. We're prompted to ask God for the wisdom by the faith that we have. Because we've asked him time and time again, Lord, I don't understand this. Lord, help me. Give me your wisdom here. How am I going to do this? And what does he do? He gives it. Because we ask in faith and we're genuine and we're sincere. And so when we come up on another situation, what are we going to do? We're going to ask the same thing. And so it's our faith that prompts us to go to him and ask him. Because he's never let us down. Now, he might not give us what we want. It might not come exactly when we want it to come. But he never fails us. And so you and I, because of our faith in him, our faith drives us to him. And we go to him. So let him ask in faith with no doubting with no doubting no hesitation you ever pray like this lord i don't think you'll do this but that's a lot of faith isn't it that's really depending on him no no turn to hebrews hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 this is the passage on the roll call of the faithful and in verse 6, we're told how to approach God. Hebrews eleven six, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists must believe that he is indeed El Elohim Adonai El Shaddai Yahweh. He is who he says he is. We don't doubt that at all. And so we come with confidence to the throne of grace to find the help, to receive the help when we need it. And he's always there so but we must believe in him no doubting whatsoever then they go then james goes on and describes the person that is doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind and all of us have been next to water the beach the gulf the ocean and we've, we've seen how the wind comes across the water. The waves go in this direction and that direction. That describes a person without faith in God. Notice also as we go into verse 7. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Is always changing his or her mind. They don't know what they're going to do. You're not going to receive anything. It says, let not that person suppose. The word suppose means to expect. Don't expect anything from the Lord when we don't even have faith in who he is and who he says he is. You're not going to get anything. And then he says, this person is a double-minded man. Actually, the word double-minded there translates literally two souls. Now, nobody has two souls. It just shows the instability of the individual. They don't know what they want. And they don't know the one that they're asking to help. Some believe that this is actually a non-believer that they say they have faith in God. <clears throat> they might believe that God exists, but they don't have Christ as their Savior. That's the cause of the instability. And so <clears throat> he's unstable in all of his ways. 
But the believer in Jesus Christ, those of us who trust in Christ alone for salvation, we know the Lord. We know who He is. We walk with Him every day. He lives within us by His Holy Spirit. How does this apply to us? How does this apply to us? When we're wrestling with a decision, which way do we go? How am I going to do this? How does this apply? Well, <clears throat> there are three people I want us to look at in the uh, two in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. First one is Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. So let's go to Genesis 15:8. <clears throat> let's go to Genesis 15:8. One of the characteristics of uh, Abram or Abraham <clears throat> that we're, we're always aware of is the faith of Abraham, how God told him to leave his country and his family and go to the land and I'll tell you when you get there you just pack it up and go and Abram did it and then God making a covenant with Abram <clears throat> and Abram just always responded but look in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 8 let's look at verse 7 and he said to him I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I should possess it? There it is right there. Abraham's struggling. Notice that when God addresses Abraham, look how he addresses him in verse 7. <clears throat> I am Yahweh who brought you out from the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land. I am the unchangeable God. I'm the one that made the commitment to you. I'm going to give you this land. And the Lord was reminding Abram of who he is. <clears throat> and Abram said, how do I know I'm going to possess it? Abram wasn't doubting God. He was wondering, how's this going to happen? How's this going to happen? All this land you've promised me, how is this going to take place? And so Abram is not doubting God. He's wondering the course that God's going to take to give that land to him. You ever wonder how things are going to work out in your life? You and I face with circumstances and situations and we just look at ourselves and our own abilities and it's not there. And so we say, how's this going to work? What, what in the world's going to take place here? We're, we're not doubting God and who he is. Our faith is still in God. That is still very much intact. It's just the details aren't quite clear to me yet. And so I wonder, God, how are you going to do this? And we know what happened. God gave him the land, didn't he? Because he didn't doubt God. He kept his faith in God. But because of his humanness, because of his flesh, his uncertainties, he wasn't real sure how all this was going to work out. Now let's go to Sarah. Let's go to Sarah. Chapter 18, <clears throat> chapter 18, verses 9 through 15. Sarah has obviously been informed by Abram about, uh, Abraham about the child. And these Yahweh and a couple of angels come to visit Abraham. Look at verse 9. And they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, 
shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. All of us have been in Sarah's situation. We're in a situation where Humanly speaking, it is impossible to work out. I just don't see what is going to take place. God, help me. God, give to me your wisdom. Show me my responsibility in this situation, please. But I just don't see how it's going to work out. And this is what happened to Sarah. Almost the same thing with, with Abraham. But Sarah was a little deeper because she was only looking within herself and being very honest with her inability as a woman at her age. And she laughed on the inside. <laughs> There's no way this is going to happen. Have you ever said that? Have you ever said that about yourself or about yourself? There ain't no way this is going to work out. And what happens? God works it out. And then when, the, when Yahweh said to Sarah, you did laugh, what was her response? She's scared. She was afraid. She knew Yahweh. And Yahweh had confronted her in her heart with her denial. And this is what God does to us. He confronts us with our sin, with our inabilities and our fears and our anxieties. He makes us sit up and take notice of what our heart was really like, spiritually speaking. And when he does that, are we afraid? When conviction has come to us by God, the Spirit, do we tremble when we are convicted of sin or do we deny the sin? All right, well, we like Sarah, I didn't, uh, I didn't do that. And the Holy Spirit comes back and says, yes, you did. So we need to admit within ourselves our own anxieties and our own fears and our own inabilities, our own flesh. We all have them. They're all there. But because of our faith in Christ, believing that God exists as he has revealed himself to us in Scripture, we rise above that. And we look at ourselves and say, I can't do this. There's no way I can do this, Lord. And you know that. Help me. We humble ourselves before God. We look to Him, the only source of wisdom, believing that whatever we need, He is indeed going to give that to us. And we need to believe that and trust in that. And then wait on him and watch and see how he works. And he always does. Now it might take him a little more time than you and I want him to take. And he might work in ways that we're looking over him to come through that door back there. I know this is the way God works. And what does he do? He comes over here. He comes in ways that you and I would never expect. But he comes. He answers he walks us through whatever circumstance or situation we're in. Because he knows our inabilities. He knows our fears and in our anxieties. But he doesn't let that stop him. And he rises us up above all of that 
And once again, he demonstrates to us his love to us and his care for us. And he walks us through those situations. We do not doubt who God is. But sometimes the human element in us and our role and responsibility in the situations we're faced with overwhelms us. And when it does, we cry out to God, and we should. And what does he do? He gives generously, without reproach. And he does. Now, let's turn to Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. In this instance, in Mark chapter 9, verses 21 through 25. In Mark 9, actually the, the text begins in verse 14, where this man brings his son to the disciples to cast out this demon. And they're not able to do this. And the Pharisees are there. And the Pharisees get in an argument with the disciples. You guys aren't any good. You can't do this. And Jesus comes up. And if we pick this account up in verse 21. Jesus is addressing the father. And Jesus asks his father, how long has this been happening to him, to the son? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. It's my unbelief that's the problem. That's the part that scares me. That's the part that sends me into anxiety and worry. And what does the man say? Help my unbelief. This man is confessing his inability. He is up front. Jesus, I can't do this. I need your help. And this is what the Lord expects of each of us. Because he knows you and I can't do it. He knows we can't work it out. But look what James says. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Are you and I ready to admit to God, I lack wisdom? I can't figure this one out. I need some help. And we go to the only source of wisdom, the source that will work it out, the source that will walk us through it, and not insult us when we come to him and as we work it out. Because he's going to give this to us generously. Look at what happened when the man cried out, help my unbelief. Look at verse 25. And when Jesus saw that a crowd coming together came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And he did. And the boy, Jesus reached down and took the boy by the hand and he got up and he gave him to his father. Jesus responded positively. Jesus didn't say, hey, you doubted me? No, I ain't going to help you out. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. I'm not going to deal with your doubt. No, he didn't say that. He immediately 
cast the demon out. The father said, help my unbelief. And this is where pride gets into our hearts and into our minds. And the fact that I can do this. I'm going to work this out on my own. I'm not going to turn to God. I can handle this. And you can't handle it. And I can't handle it. And the more we turn to God asking for his wisdom in every part of our lives, the stronger we're going to be spiritually, the closer we'll walk with the Lord, and we will turn to him more readily than we've ever turned before. Because we will know by personal experience that when we cry out to God, help my unbelief, he's going to help. And he's going to do it generously. Lord, I need help. How many of us here today need help? In every area of our lives, we need help. And yet, this little voice in us will say, you don't need to pray. You can do this. You don't need to ask God for help. No. Do it on your own. And you hear this other voice saying, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. And I will give it generously to all. But you must ask in faith you do that you are doing that you have done that I would just encourage all of us to do it more often and to respond going to God a lot faster than we normally would instead of thinking I'll handle this I can work this out I got my plan I'll put my plan in motion and it'll work and two blocks down the road, the wheels start falling off your plan because it's the wrong one. Because I should have turned to God instead of thinking I can do this. We're all there. Brothers and sisters, do what James said. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. And I will give it to all generously. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we just praise your holy name for your love to us for the salvation we have in Christ and how you live in us by your spirit and how you work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. And part of that is acknowledging we do not have the wisdom that we really need. And yet if we come to you asking for wisdom and asking in faith, you give to all generously without reproach father thank you for giving that to us whenever we have asked and we are before you right now still needing your wisdom in certain areas of our lives so father move in our hearts by your spirit to cause us to ask for your wisdom and then to watch you work and be aware of our responsibility in being obedient to you in that situation. So Father, you've spoken to our hearts here today very clearly from your word. And I pray that by your spirit, we will respond to you positively to ask you for that wisdom, knowing that you will give it. For this I ask in Jesus' name, amen.